Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport and want to hear from experts from around the world, then subscribe now because this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Martin Foster, Applied Sport Management Lead at Loughborough University. This week, I'm joined by Professor Jonathan Folland and Dr. Richard Blagrove. Richard is a lecturer in physiology and program director for the MSc in strength and conditioning here at Loughborough University. And Jonathan is a professor of neuromuscular performance, deputy associate dean of research and director of doctoral programs here at Loughborough. In today's podcast, we focus on the physiological and neuromuscular adaptations to training. Jonathan explains the difference between maximal strength and explosive strength, explaining the importance of both types of training and providing practical ways to train each area. We discuss hypertrophy and its importance on strength gains and talk about how to gain strength without increasing size. Hi Rich, welcome back. Um, thanks for coming again and doing a podcast with us. Thanks for having us back. That's okay. The last one weren't great, so it was his high expectations again today. <laughs> no um, pressure. We're with, we're with Jonathan Follin today, um, and Jonathan's not been on here before. So Jonathan, can you just give us a, a brief introduction to who you are and, and what you do? Sure. So uh, my formal title is Professor of Neuromuscular Performance here at Loughborough University. Um, and that means I teach and research in all things to do with, in practical sense, uh, strength and power and all the underpinning anatomy, physiology and biomechanics that sits behind that. Um, so I'm interested in the performance and uh, function of the muscles of elite athletes, uh, but also how strength and power and the function of the muscles relates to injury, um, as well as some health-related topics, aging, healthy aging particularly. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. Um, as our listeners will know, I'm, I'm quite a generalist around strength and conditioning and personal training and those kind of things. And we've got Rich here, an expert in strength and conditioning. So I think we're going to have a real good conversation around the research and, and the application of things. So I'll pass over to Rich, who I know has got quite a few questions to, to get into you. OK. Yeah. And like I guess, obviously, as uh, with my strength and conditioning coaches hat on, there's a lot of really interesting and obvious things that I'd like to ask you today. Um, I think that the work that you've contributed over the years sort of certainly made you one of the world leading authorities in neuromuscular physiology, and there's, there's lots of th- areas that we could delve into in terms of athletic performance um, and reducing sports injury risk. But would it be okay if you just start off just by providing listeners with a definition of, um, of the way in which you define strength? Um, and then a little bit more specifically maximal strength and explosive strength? Sure, yeah, so um, strength is basically in very simple terms the ability to produce force or torque by the muscles Um, and and it it can be broken down into different types of strength uh, according to the to the situation um, the task really or the mechanical situation Uh, and one of the uh, kind of main ways to kind of break down strength is into maximum strength which is the the maximum force or torque the muscles can produce um, with no particular time limit or, or anything on that and then explosive strength which is really the ability to produce force quickly which means uh, a limited or a small period of time so how quickly can a person go from resting or low level force muscle force production to then increasing force very quickly up to a high level it's their ability to do that kind of transition and that rapid increase in force production at the beginning of a contraction Excellent. And yeah, I guess in sports performance, the sort of time frame that we've got to produce high levels of force is obviously very limited. So for things like 100 meter sprinting, the amount of time that the foot spends in contact with the ground is about 100, uh, 100 milliseconds, so about 0.1 of a second. Um, and in a lot, a lot of other sports skills, the time constraint doesn't go much beyond about a quarter of a second. Is that yeah, sort of quite accurate? A- absolutely. So in a, in a lot of sports uh, and explosive activities, there's really not much time um, there isn't actually time to generate what what would be kind of considered a, a classic uh, maximum contraction or a maximum voluntary contraction to use the jargon um, so there isn't that much time so it's about producing force quickly which is why explosive strength probably is very important and and there's some nice evidence that in jumping and sprinting explosive strength is more important actually than maximum strength um, and exactly as you say you know you can theoretically you that kind of makes sense because 
when running, sprint running at a high level, you know, the foot is in contact with the ground for 100 milliseconds. There isn't much time to apply force to the ground and generate forward propulsion. So you need the muscles to contract very quickly uh, and start producing force very quickly um, in, in order to be useful. And in injury situations, there's, you know, similar kinds of evidence that, for example, with, with ACL, anterior cruciate ligament injuries, which is one of the most um, common but major severe traumatic injuries in sport, uh, those injuries, some of them seem to occur very quickly on, on landing um, from a jump or, or uh, and you know, maybe even within the first 50 milliseconds, which is, you know, just five hundredths of a second. So producing force quickly from the muscles to stabilize the joints and, and stop the person going in to bad positions and postures where the joints in this case the knee joint gets injured is 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 key yeah and so within this sort of context of sports performance so in improving performance and also reducing the risk of injury we need to express as much force as we can in this in this uh, limited time and hopefully this doesn't sound like too much of a dry question but physiologically what are the main sort of structural so what I mean by that is um, things relating to the muscle and the tendon um, what sort of structural factors govern an athlete's ability to express explosive force and also what sort of neural factors so factors relating to the nervous system sure. might also contribute yeah it's an interesting question because it's, what actually happens is that the most important factors or determinants, if you like, of the ability to produce force quickly, explosive strength change during a contraction. So when you first start from rest, the most important thing in the first 50 or 100 milliseconds of contraction is the ability to activate the muscle, essentially the ability of the nervous system to switch the muscle on. Um, and, and that's absolutely crucial in that first little period, 50, 100 milliseconds of contraction. Uh, after that, the emphasis shifts somewhat more because the muscle is, in most people, after 50 or 100 milliseconds, is already on. Most people have switched the muscle on, and then it's not so much about switching it on anymore because it already is on. It's about what the muscle can do. Uh, it's basically getting a, a, a drive, uh, an activation from the nervous system to to contract, and it's how quickly the muscle can contract. And and uh, there's a whole range of factors in there. Certainly, the size of the muscle is important the fiber type composition of the muscle is probably important um, a stiff tendon may be a little bit but we've not really found much evidence for that actually um, but the, the size of the muscle and the fiber type would be key um, you talked about activation there I just yes. got a, a, a random question for you here yes so how important is that warm-up in creating that that activation um, for the muscle to switch on is it important in terms of activation? Or? Yeah, it's a great question, and there's been a lot of attention, um, particularly in the applied SNC literature, to potentiation um, and this phenomenon called post activation potentiation, which is basically where some prior contractions or some warm up might enhance what comes a few minutes later. Um, but in terms of the neural activation, there's not a great deal of evidence to say that it's better after warm up. There are there are clearly some advantages of warming up the muscle temperature gets better and that, yeah. that helps power production and various other things does it help the nervous system there's nothing very clear to show that it does there's, there's, there's two reasons to ask it one of my one of my friends always always refused to warm up which was a bit silly but in terms of <laughs> activation he used to he used to uh, talk about leopards and you don't see them stretching and warming up in a jungle they can just go so for, in terms of an activation mm. perspective I, I thought it was actually quite a relevant yeah. question along with something that was a little bit silly um, but also you hear the likes of Rio Ferdinand's talk about this before that people are doing a warm-up for their warm-up and you know again quite often you hear the phrase activation and activating muscles and i just wondered you know how relevant it was not that it's not that warm-ups aren't relevant you know that they are but i just wanted yeah. that in that instant yeah i i would agree with that in terms of uh warm-up is, is warm-up good for activating the muscles or improving the activation of the muscles i'm not aware of any real clear evidence for that um, it, it, you know, you could make various rationales that it could help, but it's actual evidence, mm, not sure. Um, 
So I guess related to my previous question around the different factors that might govern someone's ability to to express high levels of, of force, um, obviously strength and conditioning coaches and personal trainers working with the public, they use a lot of different uh, loading regimes with uh, their clients and athletes mm. to try and achieve some sort of strength um, related adaptation. What are the main sort of structural and neural adaptations that we typically see with uh, different loading strategies? So max strength versus explosive strength? Yeah, well, I think uh, particularly if, if you do high load, relatively high load training, um, classically, you know, one of the major adaptations, certainly in the long run, um, over over a number of months, is that you get muscle hypertrophy. The muscles get bigger, and you also get structural changes within the muscle in terms of the architecture and the organisation of the muscle. Um, they're some of the main ones that you get with high load training over certainly over a prolonged period of time. Um, but if if a, an athlete or, or any recreational participant actually, if they engage in more what, what I would call kind of more explosive training, where they're trying to practice that activating and using the muscle quickly and getting it to produce force quickly, um, what you see is you see um, some nervous system adaptations that are very specific to that ability to produce force quickly. Um, and that is probably very useful in those situations that we talked about earlier to do with producing force quickly, say whether you're a sprinter or a jumper or um, an athlete in, in many different sports. Um, there are, from those explosive type training, you get neural adaptations that are specific to that ability um, and that are useful for improving that ability. Mm. Um, so if that comes into your sport in any way, shape or form, or might help you to, to reduce your risk of injury, I would advise doing some explosive type training. Yeah. Just from a practitioner perspective, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about high load or, you know, where is that? s and coaches are going to ask, you know, do I need to be working at 70%, 80%? And yeah, I know it's a question that's sure. always asked, but where, where would we pitch yeah. any of this at the moment? So in terms of high load, generally you're talking about 70, above about 70% of one repetition maximum, you know, maybe going up to 80%, 90% occasionally. Um, th that's broadly the, the range you're talking about with high load. Um, to do more explosive or power training activities, you're talking about somewhere in the region of 30 to 40, maybe up to 50 or 60%. Of, of 1RM or maximum load. Um, the ACSM guidelines talk about doing power training in the 40 to 60% range. Um, and that's kind of what I'm talking about in terms of more explosive power type training. I think, yeah, and the important thing there is that the load that you, you're trying to move is, is moved with intent, it's moved with a high level of effort as rapidly as you yes. possibly can, rather than just moving it through range like you would be at sort of 70, 80%, which, yeah, the speed that you're moving is dictated by the, the load that's that's on the bar or, or that you're trying to lift. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and I would suggest, although we, we don't have all the evidence to show this, but I would suggest that even just practicing starting from rest or a low, real low level and then increasing force if that's what you have to do in your sport then it makes sense to kind of practice that in your training and in your your strength and conditioning work starting at a rope low level or rest and then do it quickly rather than just keeping tension in the muscle all of the time when you're doing your repetitions if you if the muscle never relaxes down to rest then the only time you practice that initial part of the contraction is on the very first rep after that you don't ever practice that first part of the contraction so it kind of makes sense to me if, if that's useful in a sporting context then then make sure you do that transition from rest into the contraction mm. And is either part of your research or just, I guess, uh, general guidelines that a body like the ACSM might recommend, how many repetitions of that, of that type of work would you suggest before the athlete or an individual has yeah. a rest? I mean, that, that's less well-defined, I yeah. would say. I mean, certainly from, from a more traditional high-load, um, relatively heavy resistance training, you know, it's pretty clear. You know, there's a lot of guidelines that, you know, 6 to 12 RM lifted... Um, that, that number of times four sets or three or four sets would be a fairly standard Absolutely. recommendation but for the more explosive training there isn't nearly as much work been done but probably a similar number of reps even though it's a lower load but remembering that each of those reps is done as you you know correctly highlighted with with maximum intent to move as quickly and explosively as possible 
would you, would you still as a practitioner so S and C wise I, you know I've not been around it much for, for a little while now would it be the, the quality over quantity kind of thing yeah with, as with Jonathan's that? alluded to I, I don't think there's um, a great body of evidence to sort of dictate exactly how many reps you do but there's bits and pieces from the weightlifting literature overhead medicine ball throwing and so on that have kind of indicated that after about five or six repetitions you have this sort of very significant drop off of, of things like power output so typically when I'm working with athletes and I'm trying to develop explosive strength they won't go much over about six repetitions because then you can start to see sort of some visual signs some deterioration and some fatigue building into their technique and so they're not really getting the quality of work in the set that I, that I want to get to build explosive strength and it's interesting from a nervous system or a neurological point of view to consider different types of contractions um, and the adaptations that take place so in these kind of short sharp contractions these explosive contractions trying to produce force very quickly one of the kind of key things is is the, is the firing frequency which which basically means the delivery of uh, electrical impulses to the muscle from the nervous system so these are the, the switches on to the muscle coming very quickly to the muscle uh, and the rate uh, the firing rate at which they come to the muscle is really important in that ability to produce force quickly there's lots of really good evidence for that um, but that is also trainable so training that ability to 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 switch on and, and really activate the muscle really quickly is is key uh, and it can be trained mm. with practice yeah great um just just revisiting so bu building muscle size which we refer to as, as muscle hypertrophy um like and based on your your research and the evidence available like in relative terms how important is hypertrophy to optimizing maximal force production um, I would say it's really pretty important. I mean, there's no, there's just a ton of evidence to suggest that that muscle size is the biggest uh, determinant or predictor of, of maximum strength. Uh, yeah, not that other things don't come into play as well, but certainly muscle size is the biggest thing. Probably explains somewhere in the region of. 60% two thirds of the variability in maximum strength is due to that one factor. Mm -hmm. Basically, how big are the muscles? Yeah. Um, so it's key. Yeah. And just playing devil's advocate a little bit because, um, like, obviously, you're very aware of some of the current debate that's out there around whether an increase in muscle mass actually causes an increase in muscle strength. Because, obviously, a lot of um, what you're suggesting is based on sort of correlation and relationship uh, evidence. And I know there's a few groups around the world that are, uh, have sort of been suggesting that that correlation evidence doesn't necessarily mean that the increase in muscle size is causing in the increase in strength so um, I mean certainly my position on it is very similar to yours I think you know that and Jonathan's debated this at international conference level but um, can you sort of briefly summarize the evidence around why a change in muscle mass probably does contribute towards a change in maximal force production sure uh, well because as we've just covered that one of the fundamental probably the most fundamental uh, thing in force production is the size of the muscles um, um, the, the force is generated by that contractile material so more contractile material broadly has to be useful um, that doesn't mean that uh, strength can't be improved without hypertrophy yeah, sure. it, it, it certainly can because there are some other factors that come into play certainly the neural activation of the muscle is also important um, and, and there can be an improvement in that even if hypertrophy doesn't happen and that will it will have a knock-on effect on maximum strength for sure that can happen but if hypertrophy does occur then it must contribute to an increase in in strength there is just absolutely no evidence that hypertrophy occurs and doesn't contribute that mm. would be yeah, biologically it's just totally implausible mm. it's almost like the system is adding some muscle but that isn't useful muscle when muscle is yeah. there to contract its function is to contract and produce force so if there is extra muscle it will contribute mm. 
And I think, yeah, I think the, the argument these groups make is that the increase of muscle mass is kind of like a byproduct. It's like it might be there to protect the muscle from a sort of structural integrity perspective or whatever, but it might not be actually contributing towards the increase in force, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah I'm playing devil's advocate here yeah, because sure, I, sure. I take the same stand as you. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as you said, I've debated this before in, in the literature and at conferences, and I still don't really understand the argument argument apart from the only thing that you pointed to which is uh that some of the evidence for the importance of hypertrophy and strength gain is correlational um and that's right and that's partly because to do a cause and effect study in humans is virtually impossible you you would almost need to train some people to get them to do some strength training whilst you give them a drug that prevents hypertrophy and see how big was their strength gain to people who who did normal training without a drug mm. and how you know and you'd how, never be able to ethically that's impossible yeah. and, and, and there is no drug like that anyway yeah. so it's 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 completely implausible but apart from the correlational work including some of the work that we've done finding a, a relationship between um hypertrophy or or muscle size gains and strength gains there's you know just a ton of other scientific evidence that suggests that the size of muscles is very important for strength and that gaining uh, muscle size is, is is a key player in strength gain. Yeah. Um, Where does this correlate to, to power in terms of that? Well, it's, it's, it's not that dissimilar, actually, um, uh, in terms of maximum power, because that in, in some ways is even more tightly tied to the size of the muscle. Um, because you, you can do a, a, a theoretical analysis which basically shows that uh, muscle power is even more dependent on the volume of muscle than strength is. Um, strength actually, in theory, connects more to the cross-sectional area and the area of the tissue, whereas power theoretically depends on volume. But it's a little bit different in, in many power situations because the time becomes very short, which is where we go back to the explosive aspect that we were talking about before. So in many explosive situations, uh, it's kind of situations w which are power tasks, actually what we mean is they're explosive or they're short duration tasks. So it's about producing that power very quickly. Um, uh, and then, yes, yeah, some some of the nervous system things probably become very important again. Hmm. And does that go further still when you go into speed? Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> this is where some of the practical kind of terms kind of break down a little bit because I would see speed, you, you think of a classic like the 100 meter sprint or even pitching a baseball, which is a, you know, a very low force, very low load task, but a very high velocity task. You know, it, in, in, in many ways, the, the, the most, uh, the key variable is actually power. And it's power in all these situations, but they're just mechanically different situations. So you're talking about pitching a baseball, it's about power production at very high velocity, where the forces and the load is very low, or you go to power lifting, where it's still about producing power, but it's producing power when the forces are very high, the loads are very high, and the velocity is very low, if that makes sense. Yeah. And these things are all connected through, technically, the, the force-velocity relationship, um, which was described by A.V. Hill in the 1920s, and he won a Nobel Prize for some of his work. So um, these things have been very well known in fundamental physiology for a long time. Mm. And, and we have a really good podcast with J.B. Marin about that. We well. do. Go and listen yes, to it. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how about for sports which uh, are very weight-bearing in nature and the athlete has to carry that weight around the sports arena for um, extended periods of time? So I'm thinking of the work that I've done with distance runners, as yes. a prime example, yes. cyclists and even yes. games players like footballers and uh, tennis players and so on, where an increase in muscle mass might be disadvantageous to Absolutely. them, particularly a significant yes. increase in muscle mass over time. Um, like what type of kind of loading strategy and prescription might still maximise strength gains, explosive strength gains, whilst trying to minimise the amount of, of muscle mass there? Yeah, they're, they're I think getting? essentially you're, lo you're looking to mainly focus on the neural type adaptations um, rather than the trying to change the structure and the size of the muscle or the architecture of the muscle. Um, and and so, if, if, but it d does depend on which type of maximum strength is also being sought after and in what situation you, you want to be able to express that, that strength or that force-producing capability. Um, but 
definitely looking for neural adaptation and and that may may mean a relatively small number of, of very high quality contractions um, say high high very high force not that many contractions not trying to load the muscle or stimulate the muscle to grow particularly but definitely using the nervous system um, and putting some heavy emphasis on the nervous system yeah that makes sense and I think I mean typically with uh, some of the research that I've done which is looked at the effects of strength training on distance runners like we tend to see quite big gains in strength uh, within within the space of a few months and that seems to have some link to improvements in things like running economy and time trial performance and so on and so forth but surprisingly pretty much consistently across that body of literature we don't see any change in body mass and more specifically some of the studies have actually looked at muscle mass as well and muscle cross-sectional area and they don't tend to see any sort of change in that so as Jonathan's suggesting it's probably the quite low volume of, of strength training that's included in studies like that like it's it's usually two maximum of three sessions per week they're typically not doing more than eight to ten sets of lower limb work and the repetition ranges are quite low so they're either again moving the weight very fast or they're lifting quite a heavy weight for, for a low number of repetitions which is driving more neural type types of adaptations and we're defining that as below six is that what from what you said before is this quite low? Are we going lower? Are we going three? Or where, where uh, some, I mean, so, sometimes the, the studies have used more than that. They've gone up to 12. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but again, the, f- the frequency of training is quite low. Um, the recovery time they're having between sets is quite low. They're not doing up to sort of four, five, six sets of work. They're just doing two or three sets of work. So you can obviously achieve volume of work in a number of different ways. It's not just the repetitions yeah, per set. Yeah, the overall load is Yeah, is but the, ov- the overall load is, is, is pretty low. Um, yeah. So endurance athletes often, you know, they're slightly concerned about doing some strength and conditioning because of this issue to do with putting on some muscle mass um, but it, it, it isn't generally a problem because if they do relatively low volumes of resistance training and and also they're doing their uh, endurance training anyway and 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 that tends to compromise the strength adaptations and the muscle adaptations um, so it's it's rarely a problem in any level and as, as Rich said you know they gain substantially in terms of strength and there are performance benefits of that uh, adaptation in strength um, as well as injury prevention benefits as well yeah. so you know that this is why such a wide cross-section of athletes do strength and conditioning it isn't just strength and power athletes but across the board team sports and endurance athletes because there are these benefits that are useful to them changing just slightly here and apologies if this sounds like a a very broad and slightly unfair question but it's one of those questions that coaches and physiologists to some extent are always trying to um, answer in terms of um, strength performance and and maximal explosive strength like we've been talking about how much of it do you think is driven by genetics compared to how much do you think is trainable Um, (laughs) don't worry about putting a number on it necessarily yeah that's that's a great question so I mean, it's it's really widely documented in the scientific literature that there is this variable training response between people. Um, you know, study after study where they find, say, in strength training, after a three-month period of training, some people will improve by 40% and some people will hardly improve. Um, and there has to be a substantial genetic component to that. And there is a lot of evidence to suggest that that's the case from from, from twin studies, for, for example, um, uh, and and from some detailed studies looking at at specific uh, genetic variables as well. Um, So it has to be a a big chunk of inheritance in there. And coming back to the hypertrophy work, um, there is some really nice um, kind of molecular muscle work that shows that the the stem cells, the satellite cells, the muscle stem cells, which have this amazing ability to divide, which exist in the muscle, are, are key to your ability to get muscle hypertrophy, which as I would argue is, is, is key for strength gains. Um, and people whose stem cells, their satellite cells, don't divide to provide additional cells to the nuclei, to the muscle fibers, they get a much smaller response in hypertrophy. Um, so that seems to be a key process um, and the genetics of that process um, it has to be important. We don't know 
which particular genetic markers are important in many cases. There are a few that have been suggested to be important, but the evidence for those is a little bit weak at the moment. Um, but there, there will be, over time, there will be a, a, a whole list of genetic markers that will each be found to have uh, an influence on strength gain with training. Mm. Um, but each one will only explain a real small piece of the puzzle. This yep. has been one of the things which um, has taken a long time uh, f for science generally to figure out is that for most complex traits or characteristics that humans have, it's not about one or two genes. It's probably about hundreds of genes where each each genetic variant explains maybe a fraction of a percent and they all add together. So mm. if you've got a hundred of the right genetic variants, then you know you have a great profile for strength gain or improving in performance. Um, so it's it's not about one or two genetic <coughs> genetic variants, excuse me, but but about a wider a, a wider spectrum or profile of genetic variants. I could talk about that. For, I was going to say, is, is, are there are there many uh, phys physiologists out there who are working on that profile? I know briefly of, of some that are, but are there people who are working on that? Just, yeah, you yeah. know, like the Russians used to do X, Y, Z. You know, <clears throat> uh, not there are people do, doing some work in that area, but I would argue that a lot of the work um, in exercise science and genetics has been relatively weak. Um, we're going into obviously diverse areas here, but has, has, has been pretty weak. Um, uh, uh, so where to, where to start with it, 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 explaining that? Because they, they've been what what I would call candidate gene studies. So they've been looking at single genetic variants and relating those to physical performance or responses to training. When probably in reality, as I said, each of those genetic variants explains only the tiniest fraction of the variability. So you need to look uh, at a what, what's sometimes called a, a polygenic profile. You need to look much more widely across the genome. Um, and and that's why the candidate gene studies, which first appeared in the early 2000s, I did a, a number of them myself, you know, they, they were hugely inconsistent. Um, the sample sizes were too small and they're just looking at one genetic marker and the findings are all over the place and it's a mess um, uh, and there are people who are still working on that in, in select populations which is a slightly stronger approach but ultimately it's about looking across a genetic profile of, of hundreds and thousands of genetic variants all at the same time which will be revealing um, mm. You know, and, and and there's work been done on on simple phenotypes like height, for example. You know, with hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and then when they look at, you know, several thousand uh, genetic markers and variants, then they're able to start to explain somewhere in the order of 25 or 30 percent of the variance in height. But you need a population of hundreds of thousands, and you need to be looking at thousands of genetic markers at the same time. Um, to explain only less than a third of the, the yeah, variants. Yeah. yeah, and exercise science has not got anywhere near that yet. No, um, you compare and it height. Take, it will take time. Yeah, compare height against a footballer playing a game. And, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how complex that it environment is. and the scenarios that they're in. Um, and, yeah, they have to express force and explosive force and so on and so forth. And they forth, need good endurance and future yeah, yeah. marks and incredible and awareness and skill and yeah. perception and... Each of those genes have got different, with, yeah. completely yeah. different sets yeah. of genes associated. It's uh, yes. incredibly complex to unpick. Yeah. Well, we're, we're running, we're running towards an end now. Rich, I don't know if you've got any any kind of final questions that you that you want to ask at all. Um, always lots. I think with Jonathan. Yeah, we could but, we could uh, go on. We could <laughs> certainly do some more podcasts. Thanks, Jonathan. We've heard a lot about the importance of explosive strength for both physical performance and the prevention of injury. We know that there's no evidence for the need for, to activate muscles in a warm-up, and we also started to touch upon genetics and how that can affect performance. As I'm sure you could tell, we could have gone into lots of interesting topics with Jonathan and Rich. In future podcasts, we certainly look to dig deeper into their research. As always, if you have any topics that you'd like to hear more about, then get in touch. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, 
Martin Foster on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time. <laughs>